Hey, welcome to Grace Note Recordings. In this video, we're going to continue building a Fender 5F1 Champ from this old Silvertone tube radio. In the last video, we stripped the chassis and prepared it for new electronics, as well as getting this original faceplate to function as our new volume indicator. At the time, I thought that making the original faceplate work was going to be the biggest challenge, but there turned out to be many more challenges along the way. In order to gain some momentum on this project, I figured I'd start with the tombstone housing itself. So first let's decide on the grill cloth. It may seem like a novelty, but first impressions do matter, and this design choice will be one of the first things that catches your eye. These types of projects are always a balance between the old and new. How much do I keep original and where can I include new features to improve overall quality and reliability? This just isn't true for the housing to include the speaker and grill cloth, but will be the theme throughout this entire project. Therefore, I want it to look cohesive, but also communicate that there's something different about this amp. Similar to an old hot rod that looks benign at first glance, but there are subtleties that let you know it's packing something under the hood. For the speaker, I decided to go with this 4 ohm ceramic Jensen speaker. Overall, Jensen makes one of my favorite speakers, and I know there's definitely a lot of debate over preference here, but this was a good balance between cost, reliability, and sound quality. I was hesitant to drill any holes into the housing, but there weren't really any other viable speaker mounting options. I also wanted to keep both input jacks of the original 5F1 circuit, so I had to add another hole in the front to accept the additional quarter inch jack. Also, this was the best place to mount the power light, so I placed it above the input jacks. A useful tip I found is that when you have to drill holes into this old finished wood, to make it less noticeable, just color in the inside with Sharpie so that you don't have this bright, fresh, unfinished wood showing. Now that the housing is complete, it's time to tackle the chassis. The first step with the chassis is deciding where everything will go and how everything will mount. As with any amp conversion project, there are going to be a number of limitations and constraints when it comes to component placement. This is especially true on this amp because of this massive capacitor in the center, which I decided to keep it because it allows the front volume indicator to function as well as add unique aesthetic to the amp. The cost of keeping it, however, is that the transformers and tubes are really crammed for space. The most important thing to keep in mind here is having the preamp stage as isolated as possible from the rest of the amp, because here the audio signal from your instrument is most vulnerable to interference. Interference can be mitigated to a certain extent with either twisting the wires or even physically shielding the tube, but isolation is ideal. Keeping the preamp tube as close to the input jack is also generally a good idea to minimize the distance that the guitar signal has to travel and reduce the opportunity for that signal to be interfered with. Even though this chassis is already filled with tube mounting holes, I'll need to bore them out just a little bit to accept the newer, more robust tube sockets. I also need to create a rectangular hole for the power transformer and some of the other components such as the power cable jack and power switch. While enlarging one of the holes, the stepper bit actually got caught, jerked the chassis out of the clamp, and broke off one of the metal legs on the side. Luckily, I was able to drill some small holes and reattach it with a couple of small bolts. This just goes to show you that things will go wrong and everything can be fixed in some way. Luckily, this was a very cheap and quick fix and I was able to continue the build in no time. Now that the surgery on the chassis is complete, we can begin mounting the major components. This was a major milestone of the build because it began to take shape and actually resemble a tube amp. Everything from the new tube sockets, fuse holder, input jacks, even the six volt lamp jewel gave this old radio a new life. Mechanically, everything is now ready to go and we can focus on the electronics. Speaking of, you're probably wondering what I'm mounting on the rear of the chassis. And to explain that, let's look at the schematic. 
I'm making some modifications to the circuit for safety, tone, and functionality. First, I'm modifying the power input circuit to a more modern standard, which includes taking out the death capacitor and adjusting the fuse placement. Secondly, I'm adding an alternative negative feedback circuit that can be switched between the stock 22K ohm resistor and a potentiometer. Although this idea is pretty well explored by other builders online, I got these values from an Uncle Doug video, which I'll link down below. I'm not hard set on these values. I may have to play around with them a little bit, but this is what I'm planning on for now. This is the schematic representation, and now I'll show you how it'll be wired up under the chassis. These two switches correspond to that double pull, double throw switch you saw me mount on the back side of the chassis near the potentiometer. Although I could have simply replaced the original resistor with a potentiometer, if I wanted the original value, I would have had to dial it in every time or mark out where the dial results in that particular value. Instead, I decided to make it a separate circuit so I can easily switch back to the original value instantly without hassle. Lastly, I'm wiring up the output transformer in such a way that in normal operation it will play through the onboard Jensen speaker, but when I plug in an external speaker into this output jack, it'll automatically disconnect the onboard speaker and play through whatever is plugged in. There are a few other creative ways to wire up output transformers to give you more speaker or headphone options, but that sounds like a topic for another video. So now that we have identified all the circuit modifications, let's get to work on the turret boards. Many vintage amps use point-to-point -point wiring, meaning that instead of using turret boards, they would just solder each component to the appropriate two pin or jack. This was common in older simple circuits and was feasible in smaller chassis. Since this chassis is much larger and the tubes and jacks are spread out, I decided to use turret boards to keep everything centralized and organized. This will also help in troubleshooting or even swapping out components in the future. Also, this 5F1 schematic came with a layout diagram, so I'm keeping the layout as close to this as possible to minimize the opportunity for mistakes. The turret boards are split into a ground side and a signal side. The signal side is connected to all the various tube pins and components that carry the audio signal and power throughout the amp, and the ground side is connected to the chassis and eventually to the ground prong of the power cable. This is especially important for the electrolytic filter capacitors because they have to be connected with a specific polarity. Just look on the side and it's usually a gray or white strip with a negative symbol and arrows pointing to the ground side. On the ground side, I like to solder a thick section of wire in order to provide a clear visual to where the ground is, as well as providing a solid mechanical and electrical path for the ground to travel. If these are connected in the wrong orientation, it could be harmful for you and the amp. Soldering these turret boards is one of my favorite parts of the entire build. The first challenge with the turret boards was mounting them. I lost some momentum on the project here. I went back and forth on different mounting ideas, but ended up just bending an original mount that was used on the radio and putting rubber washers underneath to isolate the boards from the metal. This keeps everything centrally located and still allows easy wiring paths underneath. I'm using two separate turd boards here simply because they're the only ones I had in stock, and when laid side by side, the layout will closely match the original. Now that the turret boards are mounted, there's just one more challenge we have to address before we wire everything up. I was always really suspicious of this power switch. When testing the resistance, it would read really high and inconsistent values and I didn't feel comfortable keeping this in the amp. After looking online, I was surprised to find that a similar replacement would cost about $15 and that was way more than I was willing to spend. So after unsuccessfully looking through my junk pile for something that would work, I found a cheap lamp switch for a couple bucks and it's a decent replacement. It doesn't have the same satisfying click and instead of rotating back and forth, it continuously rotates clockwise to cycle on and off. So I won't be able to tell if the amp is in the on or off position without plugging it in, but that shouldn't be a huge problem. At least it's reliable and will work until I can find a better replacement. And now with that out of the way, we can finish wiring everything up. 
Although this is one of the simplest guitar amp circuits, it still requires a lot of wiring. This is when I really started to appreciate the benefits of point-to-point -point wiring since it would have used about a third of the amount of wires. But overall, I think using the turret boards was the best option. As I went through and wired everything up, I followed along the schematic and highlighted each connection as it was complete to track my progress. I also inspected each solder joint along the way to catch any bad connections or cold solder joints. Although it took more time up front and was a bit more tedious, I'm really happy I did this because it would have been way more difficult if I would have waited to the end. I ended up finding a couple bad connections anyway during this process, so it was well worth it. I felt really excited at this point of the build because we had finally reached the home stretch despite all the challenges. Now that everything's wired up, it's time to begin testing the circuit. I followed the procedure outlined in the Mojo Tone kit instructions. Although I'm not using their kit to build this amp, they give a really comprehensive and easy to follow checklist. You basically just slowly apply power using a variac and plug in the tubes one by one, checking that you have proper voltages at specific points in the circuit. At this point, since it's the first time we're applying power to the amp, I want to highlight that tube amps can be very dangerous. The voltages are extremely high, enough to kill you, and if you don't know what you're doing, you can get seriously injured. I want these videos to be inspiring and encouraging to your creativity, but build responsibly and don't exceed your ability, especially when it comes to tube electronics. Now that all the electronics are working, let's put it all together. It's time to finally put my guitar through this thing and hear how it sounds. I'm extremely happy with how quiet the circuit is. I was expecting a hum and maybe some other artifacts that are common with older amps, but I am so pleased with how clean it sounds. While I'm pretty confident the negative feedback circuit is working correctly, it's a bit more subtle than I was expecting. I'll have to mess around with it a little bit and I'll probably adjust it down the road. But for now, I'm just going to continue breaking in the speaker and enjoying this new amp in my studio. Oh yes, I almost forgot. There's just one more thing before we can call this amp complete. Thanks for watching.